Welcome to this segment of High Yield Med Reviews. Uh, core Pharmacology Review will be discussing drug uh, cross reactivities and allergies. And we're going to be focusing our attention specifically today on the topic of the use of uh, furosemide or Lasix, which is one of the loop diuretics in patients who have a sulfonamide or sulfa allergy. Um, in order to kind of dive into this subject, I thought we'd start off with a case. Um, to put it into some relevance and application because uh, it's a real world scenario. So this is a 52 year old white male with a known past medical history of uh, chronic lower back pain as well as hypertension and pay, uh, some degree of valvular disorder that uh, he is unaware of the exact um, valve that's involved. Basically, he comes into the emergency department. He's been having progressive worsening of shortness of breath, which has been occurring over the past week. He's also noticed uh, new and unusual swelling to his lower extremities. He's also noticed that he can no longer lie flat, and so he's been sleeping in his recliner, which has helped him to breathe. When you review other things with him, um, review his systems, you, he does not report any chest pain, chest tightness, uh, no nausea, vomiting, rash, recent travel, no changes in diet or any medications. And as I mentioned, this has never happened before. When you review his vital signs, he's a little bit hypertensive, which is consistent with his hypertension. Pulse is uh, okay. Respirations are about 20 uh, afebrile and has a pulse ox on room air of approximately 94%. So, you know, still technically normal, but is on the lower end of the normal range, which we get, you know, sort of like a little concerned about on physical exam. He does look like he has a little bit of mild distress, mainly because of the increased work of breathing, but he's able to answer your questions in short sort of phrases. Uh, when you listen to his lungs, you can you hear some uh, rails in the bases bilaterally. He does have a, a systolic murmur that seems to be heard a little bit uh, better in the right upper sternal border without radiation to the carotids. And then he has bilateral lower extremity pitting edema, approximately two plus that goes to the thigh. When you look at his chest x-ray, you can see that he has some uh, what looks like new onset uh, mild pulmonary edema bilaterally. Uh, when you look at his labs, all these are again the pertinent positives. His serum creatinine is relatively normal. Uh, his uh, BNP, which is elevated, which would be consistent with somebody with fluid volume overload, and his troponin negative, so he's not necessarily acutely or no recently in the past a uh, couple of days have it, had a heart attack. So the diagnosis of fluid volume overload, presumptively likely new onset heart failure. Um, this patient's gonna be admitted to the hospital, um, gonna need echo further workup, um, but more importantly is gonna need treatment for the fluid volume overload. So the treatment is ordered. Uh, you put it in for a dose of uh, Lasix or furosemide, 40 milligrams for the uh, acute pulmonary edema. And uh, that is, uh, placed into the electronic medical record, but when you do that, you get an a, alert that pops up that says that the patient has a sulfa allergy, uh, consider changing therapy or warning. So then you go to review the allergy with the patient and you find out that approximately 10 years ago, they received Bactrim, uh, trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole, uh, for a cellulitis and developed a mild rash. So they didn't have anaphylaxis, didn't go into Steven Johnson's, didn't have toxic epidermal necrolysis, but did have a reported rash. And as a result, that was reported in the intake at the triage uh, when they entered into the emergency department. So relevant questions for this case are, can I give this patient then uh, with a reported sulfa allergy furosemide or Lasix? And in order to be able to answer that question and do it appropriately, you really need to be able to answer the following questions. One, what does it mean to have a sulfa allergy? Okay, and I put that in quotations mainly because people say sulfa. Um, but is that really the same thing as a sulfonamide allergy? And then does the furosemide uh, or Lasix have the same type of sulfonamide group as might be seen as in a drug like Bactrim? So let's kind of go through those. Well, sulfa allergies, when people say that, uh, that represents about up to 3% to 6% of the population. And when people use the word sulfa, what they really are referring to is a sulfonamide um, allergy. Okay, so sulfa allergy, sulfonamide uh, allergy, they're the same thing. People just, lay people use sulfa just because it's simply easier. But what is 
what is the sulfonamide moiety? Where does it really come from? Well, it comes from sulfonilamide, uh, which is an antibiotic. Uh, and when you look at their derivatives of that, and when you look at the main component of what makes up a sulfonamide moiety, you see that we have really these two groups. We have a sulfone group and an amide group. And when those two groups come together, you then form the sulfonamide group. And so this structure here is the key structure that when you're evaluating molecular structures or chemical structures of a drug, where there's this warning that sometimes pops up, because if it contains that group, then the presumption is that any drug that has that group may have cross-reactivity from one drug to another if somebody is truly allergic to a medication. So when we look at the sulfonamide moiety in the context of Bactrim or trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, this is a molecule or that's a structure that's shared um, with approval from EBM Consult. Uh, you see that we have our sulfonamide moiety, that SO2, which is represented here, and the NH2. Okay, and so again, there's your there's your sulfonamide moiety. But what's important to recognize is the functional groups that are attached to those and the orientation of it because that becomes the primary importance of answering the uh, last question of, about that we proposed at the beginning of can I use another medication when somebody who has an allergy to this particular type of sulfonamide containing moiety, uh, medication. And so that you see here on the right side we have what is called an N1 substituent which is a five member ring okay right here all right again that's attached to the NH2 where the NH2 group would have been right here see uh, and then on the other side we see that there's an N4 and the the I try to put the numbers there to correspond to you know what position it is on the six member ring but this is a N4 arylamine um, a group and it is really important to recognize that medications that contain both of these seem to be part of the problem and medications that don't contain those don't seem to be the, the, as much of a problem. So when we look at sulfonamide containing medications, we can see that we have uh, sulfonamide containing antibiotics, which are all listed here with Bactrim being the most common, but we also have a lot of non-antimicrobial agents of which loop diuretics, which is the point of this discussion, um, is one of those groups of, of medications. All right, so we've answered sort of these first two questions here. Now we need to answer this last question. Can, do patients, uh, can they get the furosemide? And is the furosemide uh, structure similar to that of a antimicrobial sulfonamide containing uh, medication? And so to remind us and to compare, this is the sulfamethoxazole from the Bactrim component. And we can see again, we just reviewed that. But if you look at the individual structures of the loop diuretics, you can see that you have your SO2 here and your NH2, but there is missing that N1 uh, substituent. Um, if you look over here, you will see the uh, N4 arylamine structure light, but there's other things on here, like we have a chlorine group, which is not found over here. Right? And then we have all these other functional groups that are attached that may change the way that the body handles or reacts to that. When you compare that to terosamide, you see that terosamide uh, is, is also different. You have the SO2, but again, we lack some of these core groups. Okay, here's SO2, NH2. So you lack some of, you see all these functional groups that are added, which is different than what we would see over here. Now, the one agent in the loop uh, uh, diuretic medication class is orthocrinic acid, which you know people historically teach is the drug of choice in patient with a sulfa allergy. Because if you look, you don't see any sulfonamide moiety at all. So all of these drugs lack the N1 a substituent and all lack the N4 arylamine. So the next question is: Is there really any evidence? that about the use of loop diuretics in patients who uh, do report a sulfonamide um, allergy. And so if you look across the literature, um, going back from the into the 80s uh, all the way up into to 2009, most of the things published are case reports. And if you look across case reports, most of the drugs involved involve Lasix. And that may have something to do with the fact that their structures are closest to uh, but not exactly the same. And you can see that some of this data says it's inconclusive. 
Some were positive by skin prick tests. Some were inclusive. Some patients resulted in other allergies, but were able to tolerate medications in other groups that contain sulfonamide moieties. So it raised questions about whether or not there was true cross resistance. So in this case, going back, uh, the patient ended up didn't receive uh, the, the afrosamide and tolerated it well and was able to be transitioned to an oral uh, Lasix uh, dosage formulation and sent home. Other options that we could have used, especially recognizing the literature, is that we could have used torosamide or, or bumetanide because their structures for sure are definitely more different than even ferrosamide compared to antimicrobial containing sulfonamide uh, drugs. And then certainly etherocrinic acid, but while etherocrinic acid is available generically in the United States, it is very difficult to find and most hospitals tend to not stock it. So let's summarize what we learned from this topic. First is just because a drug contains an S or sulfur group in it doesn't mean that that's sulfa or sulfonamide. Okay. We also recognize that antibiotics that contain sulfonamide moieties are different from drugs that also contain sulfonamide or non-antimicrobial sulfonamide containing medications. We also know that the loop diuretics in particular lack the orientation that is seen with the antimicrobial containing sulfonamide, specifically sulfamethoxazole. They don't have that N1 substituent. They don't have that N4 arylamine group uh, oriented the same way with the same functional groups. And so therefore, uh, there's really the evidence only suggests that there's case reports. And we know that case reports do not prove causality, uh, but certainly raise concern and, and alert us to potential things. And so we don't really know what the true cross-reactivity really is between uh, antimicrobial agents containing sulfonamide moieties versus non-antimicrobial agents. However, the evidence seems to be pretty weak, uh, suggesting that there is a low risk. It doesn't mean it's zero, but it's probably a low risk. Um, and so while you may use it, it may just warrant you just to pay attention a little closer, but most patients are gonna tolerate it. Most clinicians would continue to use it, again, with some degree of monitoring. So I hope you found that to be useful. I hope it was easy to understand. It was fairly concise, but made clinically relevant and obviously uh, oriented to the patient.